Well, my name is Harold Huber, and I live at uh, 5021 Lord Alfred Court here in Cincinnati or Sharonville. I was born in Wauseon, Ohio in uh, 1925. Uh, I volunteered uh, when I became 18 years old to go into the uh, U.S. Coast Guard Merchant Marine. And uh, my uh, certificate of identification at that time was Z405273. The highest rank that I achieved during that period was uh, uh, purser pharmacist mate, and I had a rank of full lieutenant in the U.S. Maritime Service. Uh, I don't recall whether I joined in uh, Wauseon, Ohio, or Toledo, Ohio, but usually those the recruitment centers were in Toledo, so I suspect that that's where, where it was. And uh, the date that I uh, was told to report was June 1943, which is immediately after my graduation. So I graduated and uh, probably the next day or two I was on a bus to Toledo, Ohio and a train to New York. Now, uh, excuse me, could we do sure. something about the training? Sure. Uh, the basic training was in uh, Sheepshead Bay, New York, uh, from June 43 to August of 43. It was about six weeks, roughly. Uh, the place is uh, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard uh, Maritime Service Training Station at Sheepshead Bay in, in, in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And uh, the facilities were primarily uh, typical barracks, uh, clapboard buildings, if you will. And uh, in the summer, it was uh, boiling hot and bone chilling <laughs> cold in the winter from the cold Atlantic. So uh, uh, when we arrived in New York, which was uh, an experience for a kid from a small town in northern Ohio to uh, end up at uh, Grand Central Station and come out with all those skyscrapers and what have you. I was standing there with my mouth open, I'm sure. But anyway, we were uh, transported then to Sheepshead Bay, uh, given the burr haircut, and uh, issued uh, blue denim shirts with jeans and white boxer shorts, t-shirts, and white sailor hats with uh, big heavy GI shoes and uh, given all our inoculations and, and what have you and confined to base for the, for the next six weeks. Uh, when, uh, when we were able to uh, have leave, we were later given uh, uh, white uniforms with black dress shoes and, uh, and uh, we be be were given liberty at that time, but up for the first six weeks we were confined to to the camp or to the base. Um, I was an apprentice seaman at that time, so I, I, as I recall, it was like $37 a month or some ridiculous amount of money. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was enough to have some spending money uh, when you went into New York for liberty. That was about it. Um, you ask about uh, the enlisted men's ranking Correct. orders. And in that case, uh, uh, I should point out that we, the US, U.S. Coast Guard training personnel there had the conventional Navy uh, rank and order, uh, the, uh, which ranged anywhere uh, for, for the officers from Lieutenant J.G. up to Lieutenant Commander. Uh, the U.S. Maritime, however, <coughs> went by uh, seaman, oiler, or steward, depending on their job on board ship. And uh, the ranks for the officers were uh, captain and first mate, second mate, third mate, boatswain, carpenter for the seamen. And in the engine room, you had the chief engineer, the first engineer, second engineer, third engineer, boilers, and uh, so forth. And in the stewards department, you had the cooks and the bakers and, uh, and the mess men. And, uh, That was the rank, those were the ranks that we recognized for the most part, uh, whether, whether it was a captain or mate or second mate or whatever. Usually the further down you go, like third mate, he was a rookie like I was on my first journey out. 
uh, and that's where you uh, where you started. Um, you ask about cars and trucks uh, during that period, and I don't remember a whole lot because all we dealt with were boats and ships. <laughs> And uh, I spent the first six weeks trying to learn the difference between a, a boat and a ship and, and, to, and to speak that way. And you were s reprimanded severely if you called a ship a boat. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you might explain the difference between a ship and a boat. A ship and a boat. Well, the easiest way is that the, the, boats, the boats were the things you crawled into to abandon ship. <laughs> <laughs> a boat will go on the ship. <laughs> yeah, boats go on the ships. And, uh, uh, that was one of the uh, <coughs> uh, big things that we got a lot of training on was how to handle lifeboats and those were big heavy uh, boats with oars in them for for power not motors uh, and you had uh, sea anchors and all that good stuff to, to control the direction that you were going keep you from drifting uh, uh, in the currents and what have you uh, we trained extensively in raising, lowering those boats and loading them with personnel, and how to launch them properly, how to steer them, and uh, how to utilize all the life-saving equipment that we had in the boats and how to survive at sea. And when you completed all that training, that you were given a certificate of efficiency for handling a lifeboat and uh, certified that you qualified. As for a typical day, uh, at basic training, uh, uh, you, they would start off with a bugle call like all uh, can, uh, training camps. And you would wash, dress, make your bunk suitable for inspection where you could bounce a coin on it and all that good stuff. And, uh, and then periodically there was a short arm inspection Excuse that me. everybody had to succumb to. Bounce a coin off the... Off the uh off the off of the blanket on the T tell me that works <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, um, it, it doesn't work it doesn't work but you, you did your best to uh, to make it taut as you could uh, <clears throat> then uh, you'd line up uh, when you lined up for inspection of course uh, after you were dressed and so forth uh, uh, they would issue the uh, uh, the special assignments such as KP and scrubbing out the head policing the grounds and, and so forth. Uh, so you were assigned that week for one of those special duties. Um, then you would, uh, then we would usually head out for physical training, uh, gymnastics where you'd go through quite a, to the, go to the parade grounds and, uh, and get a good heavy workout. And then we would, then we were, uh, we would break for, for breakfast to the mess hall. Uh, the thing about the mess hall that I remember is that we had a lot of watery scrambled eggs for, for morning <laughs> mess, and I don't recall the food as being very tasty, but when you're hungry, uh, it all tasted pretty good. Uh, as I recall, uh, everyone had to uh, serve at least one week KP, and, uh, uh, and then uh, you had to scrub the decks in the barracks. And, uh, I can remember it seemed like it was a foolish exercise to be scrubbing those decks when they were already clean, but nevertheless we did it with scrub brushes and down on our hands and knees with a bucket. Uh, and we also had, we were responsible for cleaning the retreats and, and general cleanup of the barracks area. Uh, we spent an awful lot of work with uh, boats and uh, learning seaman skills as tying knots and all that good stuff. And then we had to learn the oilers' duties, which meant uh, becoming familiar with marine engines and their maintenance and how they differed from uh, stationary engineers uh, type of equipment. Uh, and uh, although I qualified for a, a steward mess man, I don't recall much other than serving the KP duty <laughs> for a week or two. Uh, we didn't get any liberty during this time, and I guess it seemed like an eternity before before that was all over, but your arms were sore from shots and everything else, so I don't think I would have enjoyed too much <laughs> free time anyway. But uh, after the six weeks of completing that, and that ran up till about uh, August of uh, 
of uh, 43, June to August. Um, uh, I had uh, volunteered to join the, the Merchant Marine so that I could be a, a pharmacist mate. And uh, the role that they had was what they called a, a purser pharmacist mate. And purser on board a, a merchant vessel is the captain's flunky and uh, your job is to do whatever the captain wants you to do and uh, in terms of paperwork and, uh, and also exercises for him. You're responsible for the bills of lading and the, uh, the uh, payroll, which became uh, probably the biggest job. And you had to keep all the records for the, uh, for the payroll. Uh, and, and, and in this case, uh, uh, we had to spend about, uh, I think it was maybe a month to six weeks uh, learning all the paperwork and what have you that were entailed in the, in the purser's role. And uh, then I spent the, uh, another three months uh, uh, learning the basic skills and knowledges, uh, knowledge for a pharmacist mate on board ship. And we were the only medical care except on the last ship that I served on. Uh, for the crew. Um, so we spent a, a lot of time uh, trying to learn uh, which sulfonamide get, drug to give for which uh, illness and uh, what to do for broken teeth and, and uh, minor injuries that we get on board ship. And uh, then we spent uh, quite a bit of time in the uh, pathology department of the uh, New York City morgues. Uh, we would go in and uh, watch autopsies and, wow. and he would show us uh, uh, how people died and oh, lungs from smokers and well, we learned all kinds of good things way back then but uh, and we saw murder victims and what have you. Uh, so we got a pretty good uh, variety of uh, corpses that had died from violent crimes as well as uh, other illnesses that we might encounter. How in regards to the pharmacy training, did you uh, have any time in uh, local hospitals or such to uh, practice? Actually, uh, after we completed the, uh, the basic uh, three months training uh, for pharmacist mate purser, uh, uh, I was shipped to uh, Seattle, Washington to the Marine Hospital for another three or four months of training. So we got really on-site training mostly at the Marine Hospital. And uh, I'll get into that a little bit here in, in a moment. Uh, also while we were in training, we had to conduct the short arm inspections, which I mentioned earlier, and also spend time in uh, sick bay, taking care of the illnesses that came up uh, there at the base. and. Uh, so it was during this period that we also were able to have, have liberty, our first liberty. And, and uh, back then it was a big thing to, to uh, try and pick up tickets for any freebies you could get, baseball games or f football games or whatever. And at that time of year, which was uh, from August to September, it was football season. So we were always scrounging trying to get New York Giants football games. And that would be the main thing for, for liberty. Uh, and one thing that stands out in my memory, uh, uh, besides the bitter cold of, uh, of uh, Sheepset Bay, was getting uh, USO tickets to, to go to the Giants game or see a Broadway play. That was always a, a big thing. Um, and we would uh, we'd have off from Saturday Saturday noon for Liberty until uh, Sunday evening, so you had. You could go take in a play or see a football game and then take a long subway ride back to, to Brooklyn and it was a long ride back there to that <laughs> cold base. So on the way back, I, as I recall, I had about a week's uh, liberty on my way from New York to the U.S. Marine Hospital in, in Seattle. And uh, everything I owned was packed into a canvas sea bag, round canvas bag and with a drawstring on it. And you, threw that thing over your shoulder and that's how you carried all your possessions back then. 
Uh, also remember the pea coats that we wore. That, that, that was an interesting thing too. We talked about the cold weather in, uh, in New York. We used to have these wool sweaters, black wool sweaters that you would pull in, on, pull, put on over your your long underwear. We wore long underwear, and I mean longies, turned down here and wool because of the bitter cold. And you'd wear this wool thing which was so scratchy to wear, but you'd pull it on, and then you'd put your blue shirts on over over that, blue denim shirts, and then a pea coat over that, and a black stocking cap. And that's what you'd use to, to fight off the cold out there. But uh, anyway, that was, uh, that was an interesting experience. They were Larry back then. Pardon? You say they were Larry in clothes back then. Oh yes, absolutely. Oh yeah, and that's the way you stayed warm. Sure. And you could still row boats and, and carry out the, the job because if you, if you didn't, well, you weren't worth much. Uh, so after completing this advanced training in New York, I uh, we went to Seattle. And uh, I, rem I remember this was uh, my first really long train ride from New York to, to, to Seattle across the country. I did have about a week off uh, to stop off at my home. My home was right on the New York Central in Washington, Ohio, uh, between Chicago, uh, Chicago and New York. So I stopped off there, went on to Chicago, and then got another train which took me all the way to, to Seattle. And uh, that was quite a thing. Uh, we sat up in the train all the way in a coach, but we were permitted to go up into the dining car to eat our meals. And uh, the one thing that stood out in my mind, uh, and, I, and I, that's the only thing I remember, was eating a, a, a roasted salmon from uh, Seattle, of course. Uh, and it was just absolutely delicious. The first time I'd ever eaten any of that. <clears throat> and that really stuck in my mind. But other than that, uh, you, you were grimy and tired and dirty, and you never could quite feel good until you got to, uh, your destination and took a bath because it, <laughs> you were oily and greasy all over. Uh, the trains were really bouncy and, and uh, did a lot of swaying back and forth, but the scenery, particularly in the western part when you went through uh, some of the parks and areas of that sort that were just absolutely fantastic and for a kid 18 years old and never been out of any further away in Toledo, Ohio, <laughs> which is 50 miles from Wausau, <laughs> and that was something. And uh, anyway, uh, the next couple of months then I spent working in the Marine Hospital as an orderly or pharmacist mate, taking care of patients. And each week we spent on a different floor, and each floor was uh, designated for a different malady or disease, if you would. Uh, they had one floor actually, which was a maternity ward, which surprised the Dickens out of me, but uh, there was one there for for. Uh, wives of the, of the spouses of the uh, uh, mariners that we were taking care of. And then they had another one or two floors which were dedicated to venereal disease. And back in those days, uh, syphilis and gonorrhea was uh, the big thing. And uh, they, those, the, the treatment of those guys was uh, the big thing that stuck out of my mind and I can remember uh, the agony that those poor guys would go through when they'd pass the sounds up through the urethral tract to, to keep them clear from uh, closing down on them and, uh, and uh, the problems they'd have with the swollen scrotums and everything else. Do you have any idea how many beds that would encompass? Oh, I don't know, but I know it was at least 50 or more. So. Actually, while we were there, uh, one of my jobs was to go around and uh, collect blood <coughs> samples from patients uh, to carry to the labs. And uh, the one thing that stood out in my mind was uh, I was assigned one day to a, a group of uh, Russian sailors that were there. Really? Now, how they got there, I, I have no way of knowing, but uh, they were there. Remember, this is Seattle, so we're not all that far from where the Russian Russian ships would be uh, putting in. And they were very fair-complected and, and uh, 
small tiny veins and I had one heck of a time trying to find veins to get blood out of those guys and I had to finally go get some help <laughs> and uh, it was uh, quite an experience uh, but uh, all in all we had pretty good training there we did have very limited uh, medication but uh, uh, we were treating sailors and, uh, and uh, seamen so it was we were treating the kinds of things that we would run into on, on board ship. Um, I think it was, it was about April of 44 that I was then assigned, after completing my job in the, uh, or completing my tour in the hospital, to the Griffith Steamship Line, <coughs> which was a uh, a shipping company in Seattle that was an agent for the U.S. government to carry out the management of ships, including the hiring and payment of U.S. maritime personnel uh, for ships under their jurisdiction that were subsequently assigned to the uh, Army. And the Army would direct the cargo and the destination of where these ships were to go. And uh, during that time, I worked. Uh, with the accounting department to learn the role of the purser such as page and, and prepa uh, preparing the pay sheets and uh, keeping all the data that I needed for that uh, that job um, I mentioned earlier that we were also responsible for the bills of lading and all that sort of thing but uh, during wartime the captain would uh, secure those documents in his safe they Nobody would know where they were, where we were going, what the cargo was, other than what you could see with your eyes being loaded into the into the hole. And uh, one other job that I had, uh, which took up uh, part of my time, was uh, as purser, was that I was responsible for what we called a slop chest. And my wife asked me what a slop chest is, and that's that's a. a Mariner's term for a small room full of uh, uh, cigarettes and pea coats and underwear and things that they uh, they want to buy or need during the voyage at sea, and there was no cash uh, required to make a purchase. Uh, I would have to keep track of what they bought, and it was uh, charged against their uh, their uh, pay, and would be deducted then uh, at the time they they uh, they were paid off. Uh, I was trying to recall what the price of cigarettes were, and I think it was something like 25 cents a carton, which sounds almost ridiculous now, but uh, remember there was no tax charged on any of this, and uh, whatever it cost the government to buy those cigarettes was what we, what we charged the people, so uh, that, was, that almost became uh, more of a, uh, an exchange item. Than, than money itself, although money did uh, was was used for uh, crap games and card games, <laughs> as you can well imagine. Uh, actually, after the end of this uh, training period, working in the office uh, in Seattle, I was then assigned uh, to work with uh, uh, my first sea captain, uh, Captain James, and he was a big big husky uh, Norwegian um, uh, and he and I were uh, were sent to uh, uh, San Francisco as I recall to uh, one of the Kaiser shipyards to pick up a brand new Liberty ship mm -hmm. and uh, we went down to San Francisco and uh, and in San Francisco the American president lines was the agent the government's agent for the ships in that area and so they became our sub-agent for uh, the Griffith Line and although I reported everything to the Griffith Line while I was in San Francisco I would report everything into the American President Lines so I would work with the, the, the company personnel there that I needed to and uh, uh, we, we uh, picked up this uh, new Liberty ship called the SS Mariscal Sucre whose name it is or for who it is I have no idea I just know that the thing that stuck in my mind is that we later call it the musical screw <laughs> because the first few days out of, uh, out of port, that every time the screw would turn over, you could hear that thing turning over and they finally got the 
thing oiled properly and got rid of that because that would alert every submarine in the area if we didn't. But uh, we nicknamed it the musical school and that, that, that name stuck from then on. Nobody would pronounce the name Mariscal Sucre. <laughs> and uh, we had a crew of about uh, 40 men which we signed on uh, to articles uh, in May of uh, May 2nd, 1944. Excuse me, what would articles be? Articles are the documents that all um, um, uh, merchant mariners sign when they go on board ship. And I'm sure you've read stories about how when you sign on board ship, the captain now becomes your president, your governor, your, you obey everything that he says, you're responsible for him, to him, and uh, you actually have a set of articles that are laid out that you are agreeing to when you, uh, when you go to sea uh, under uh, that captain. And so they call those articles and uh, you, you sign on uh, uh, until and are responsible to that captain until the end of the, the voyage when, and you, then we sign off. Uh, uh, at that time we were assigned cargo, cargo by the Army and uh, we had no idea where we were going or what we were carrying and only the captain knew uh, what was where we were going to head uh, after we got out at sea he would uh, give us some indication and, and, and as I remember he told us we were going to the South Pacific and that's all we knew but uh, back in those days uh, you remember Pearl Harbor this is in 1944 so it, uh, Pearl Harbor had they had wiped out most of the, the bulk of the Pacific Fleet, so there were no destroyer escorts or not enough destroyer e escorts to set up any kind of a convoy in the, in the in the Pacific. Uh, all the escorts were in the North Atlantic, and uh, there was nothing left really for the Pacific. There were a few DEs, uh, destroyer escorts that were down in the islands, but that was about the extent of it. So what they did was uh, in the Kaiser shipyard. They'd mount a, a uh, three-inch cannon on the, on the foredeck and a five-inch cannon on the after deck. And then in, uh, in, in, in the fore midship and uh, after, they would have 20-millimeter uh, uh, anti-aircraft guns uh, mounted on both port and, and starboard sides, uh, armed by a Navy gun crew, as we call them. Uh, these were Navy seamen trained uh, to handle those, uh, those guns and their full-time job on board ship was to keep those guns and oiled and ready to go and, uh, and they spent an awful lot of time training on them and keeping them ready to, ready to go. As I recall, we had a Navy ensign who was uh, in charge of the, of the gun crew. He was the only, uh, the only naval officer on, on board that ship. So we had a merchant crew of about 40 people and uh, a gun crew of about 20 people, 20 men, no women. Uh, we uh, took all of the ship's stores, including food and water and uh, the, small, the small stores for my uh, slop chest at the American President Line Pier. Then the, pier, the ship was moved to the uh, uh, Navy Pier for, for loading Army cargo. And on this first ship, they uh, loaded it with ammunition, which nowadays is called ordnance. Uh, and we had all kinds of ordnance, everything you could imagine, uh, along with uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, jeeps and trucks uh, into the hold. And then after they had the hold completely filled, and remember these Liberty ships are like one big uh, uh, storage vessel or storage barn really they're floating huge warehouse. they're floating warehouses exactly what they are or were and um, when they had all of that on then they lashed uh, landing craft onto the decks so we we were when they got us loaded we were uh, we had a very low draft and uh, the water line was pretty close to the first deck so uh, we were riding low in the water Liberty ships uh, uh, were uh, uh, steam-powered uh, engines, uh, um, 
marine engines. Um, they used oil to, to fire those uh, boilers to, to drive, to produce the steam to drive the engines. And then they had this one single big prop in the rear which uh, would push this big warehouse through the water. At top speed was 15 knots and, uh, and most of the time you were probably more like 13 knots or something of that magnitude. Uh, so I remember uh, we, we passed out underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, which was quite memorable, out in the Pacific, and, and we were all on our own. Uh, no, no DEs uh, to help us uh, stay away from anything that we might run into. So after we were out at sea for just a few days, uh, and uh, most of us uh, were trying to get, were the younger guys, <laughs> landlubbers like myself were trying to find their sea legs as they say which was to keep food down <laughs> and that took about two or three days uh, at least and uh, I remember I ate crackers all that time I didn't eat much but they, the old salts kept telling me to eat crackers that was a way to to survive that period so after about three or four days why well, we uh, uh, we were able to keep food down but Actually, Pacific is, is pretty calm compared to the Atlantic, so we had that in our favor too. But when you're close to the uh, coastline, you get what they call land swells. And uh, so the first day out of uh, port, you have to you get the motion of the ship from these land swells. And so if you're heading in a south uh, westerly direction, you get some of that swell, so the ship tends to uh, rock back and forth a little bit. But we were loaded so heavy that we were almost submarines rather than a, than a, than a ship. Anyway, after uh, three or four days, the gun crew uh, were ready for target practice. And uh, I, no, I, I, I guess the Navy it was the one that supply, supplied the uh, targets, but they some ship or something was towing targets out there and our gunnery crew were practicing shooting at, the, at those towed targets, I remember that, and uh, and uh, so I guess we were better prepared uh, than uh, than having no guns at all. So anyway, we uh, we took off not knowing where we were going, other than the fact we were going to the to the South Sea somewhere. Uh, after, uh, of course. Uh, when you're at sea, it's uh, everything is four on and four off. Uh, the, the watches for both the seamen and the the engine crew and the steward's crew is four on and four off. The uh, uh, the deck crew spend most of their time uh, uh, up in the crow's nest or at the fore and aft uh, watches, looking for submarines or anything, shipping anything of any significance and uh, um, the uh, engine crew of course are down there keeping those engines going and keeping everything running smoothly. Uh, mostly at sea everything was pretty routine so it was uh, uh, you know in the South Pacific you couldn't complain the weather you know you get a lot of sunshine and beautiful sky and beautiful weather. But uh, we would always look forward, at least I did, to, to uh, meal time. And being a purser, I got to eat with uh, the rest of the officers. And, uh, and we really, we really uh, had, had it very nice. And I enjoyed the officers' mess uh, uh, a great deal. We had, we had a choice of what we wanted to eat at each meal had three meals whether you wanted them or not uh, for the most part they were they were pretty well prepared and of course we were subject to how good the cooks were and, and I, I guess I was quite fortunate most of the time we had pretty good cooks on board ship the other thing was at mealtime you'd listen to a lot of sea stories and uh, this is where you'd listen to the tales about all the adventures and wild woolly things and you'd, you'd try to separate what well, what might be true from what what <laughs> what was fiction, and uh, and we had uh, sailing out of Seattle. 
we had quite a few uh, of the mates and the uh, uh, engineer crew uh, officers who were from the Northwest, some of them from Alaska, and I used to enjoy listening to the guys from Alaska tell about the long summer days and the, the huge vegetables, uh, cabbages and vegetables that they were able to raise up in Alaska and how Alaska was God's country and that's where they wanted to go to when, uh, when this thing was all over. But it did sound like a fascinating place to, to go and I've been fascinated with Alaska ever since. Um, uh, usually the third mate and the third engineer and the radio man and the purser like myself were the landlubbers and uh, uh, just starting out so we were the young guys so most of us were 18, 19 years old. I was 18 at the time. Uh, the rest of the crew, for the most part, would be mostly middle-aged men. They were, they were experienced seamen. And my job uh, on board ship was, uh, one of the things was to maintain the sick day, so I would periodically open up the sick bay for anybody that wanted to get their aspirins or whatever. And uh, then I would also open periodically the slop chest for crew purchases, which was mostly selling cigarettes and maybe a few articles of clothing. And then uh, the other part of my time was uh, uh, staying in contact with the uh, first mate for, this, for the deck crew and the chief engineer for the engine crew and the chief steward for the uh, stewards department to collect all the uh, uh, records for the crew in terms of time and uh, uh, special assignments they might be on that, that deserves uh, special pay and what have you. And uh, during the war, the world was divided up into what they call war zones. You had uh, primary, you had an area which uh, preceded a, a battle zone, so you had even a couple classes of war zones, as I remember. But anyway, <clears throat> I had to keep track of when, uh, when we were in a war zone, uh, because that would affect the, uh, the pay of the, of the uh, ship's crew. So the uh, captain or the first mate, in this case it was usually the first mate, who was doing all the navigating would, uh, would uh, prize me when we crossed into a war zone area and then I could, uh, I could give the, the people that are right, uh, the right credits. Um, and in, on this particular voyage, uh, I, we were out for five months and 25 days from the records that I got from the Coast Guard. Uh, this was the longest uh, uh, period I was out. And this would be from, uh, from uh, April, April of 44. Uh, and uh, while we were at sea, uh, I usually had quite a bit of free time, so I would uh, I would spend a lot of time reading, or I would spend a lot of time up on the uh, bridge with the, the mates. Uh, the mates are the uh, would take turns on on being on uh, on duty. You, you 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 wouldn't usually have a first mate and a second mate and a third mate up there all at the same time, except when you're going in and out of port. Uh, but during the voyage, you would one of those uh, would have charge of the deck. And they were responsible for the navigation. And I was always interested in, in uh, their use of the sextant and, and uh, navigational instruments. And uh, they would go up there in the uh, wheelhouse and they would lay out, uh, or the map room, and lay out uh, where we were uh, continually. And they would be taking sightings uh, frequently to lay out our course. And they would, Know, had to know our speed and, and uh, where we were at. And of course, uh, involved in that was uh, keeping an accurate time. So one of the things we had to do was to, uh, the, uh, was to have the radio operator uh, get the Greenwich Meridian time to correct our clocks or make sure that our clocks were uh, uh, on, uh, were accurate and that we were, were we would, I think they determine latitude, or longitude it is, with, uh, with the time. 
part of it, and then they use the sextants with uh, uh, determining the angle between certain stars and the horizon and, and the sun and the horizon and so forth. I mean, I'm not a naval navigator, but it was uh, that's how they would determine where we were at because back in those days there was no such thing as well. We didn't have uh, GPS or anything. We didn't have GPS or any of that good stuff, so it was up to those guys. And, and I remember the the, the 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 first mate and the second mate and the third mate would all get together and compare their their notes to see if they agreed. Sure. And then periodically the captain would come up and he'd challenge them all and he'd go out and particularly in the evening. That was always a big time, or in the morning. But the evening is the thing I remember. They would take a sighting on the evening stars and certain stars, and uh, then they would compare notes to see how closely they agreed to where, where we were at. And that's how we, how we did it. Now, the rest of my time I would spend usually uh, 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 with the uh, radio operator all the ships I was on, we had one one radio operator. So that poor guy didn't have a four on off thing. He had to, he had to be in the radio shack whenever they needed him, and and he would uh, be in there periodically throughout the day and, and night as well, waiting for transmissions. And of course, we didn't send out anything unless the, the captain ordered it. Uh, we were radio silent, but we could uh, we could listen to what was. What was uh, what the traffic had to, had to say, and so it was interesting to sit in the radio shack and listen to what 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 we could in in, in voice radio, but most of it was uh, Morse code, uh, the dit dit dot thing, and that's the way all the messages were sent with with uh, Morse code, uh, and of course it was coded, so uh, nothing went out as a straight message, or at least for the most part that I recall, anything went out other than being coded. <coughs> By the same token, we'd take in coded messages. and Those would be given to the captain directly, so I never knew what they said or didn't say. And the radio operator wasn't about to tell me, but it was interesting to, to hang out with him and try to keep up on things. Uh, drank an awful lot of coffee during that period, and, uh, and uh, sometimes we'd spend some time in the Free time, I, I got initiated into playing poker, and I learned that <laughs> after a couple of games, you don't you don't play with the experts, <laughs> at least not an 18-year-old, and uh, I, I soon quit that. And uh, uh, pick your pockets. Huh? Oh, they had me cleaned out in no time at all. I didn't know what happened. <laughs> you were fine. <laughs> I was easy picking. Yeah, I was easy picking. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned the hard way. But most of the time it was just uh, open sea and uh, and uh, and watch the flying fish uh, at night. You, uh, you get a lot you get a lot of phosphorescence in the ocean as you're traveling along. So every time the, the ship's bow breaks the waves, everything is phosphorescent out to the sides, and it's really beautiful. And in the daytime, we watch the flying fish, and we get a lot of flying fish flop up on deck because we were so low on the water. They'd Ooh. come up out of the water, and they'd come down, and they'd land right on the deck instead of landing back in the ocean huh. again. So uh, we had a lot of that sort of thing. And we were always looking for uh, whatever we could see. I don't recall ever seeing a whole lot out, uh, out in the uh, first few part of the voyage. I remember... Uh, Later on, when we got down to the islands, uh, we would take uh, uh, some of the Navy's uh, sidearms and go out, and, uh, or actually rifles, and shoot at sharks. And you always had sharks following the ships because the crew would dump the garbage and the sharks were right there to pick it up. And they learned pretty soon that that's, that was a meal. So you always had a pack of sharks following your ship. And, uh, I remember we used to go out there and shoot at those things. I don't know that we ever hit any, but <laughs> it was an excuse to have some fun anyway. And uh, uh, I guess the first major event of, of this voyage and probably the, the biggest thing that happened to me uh, during my uh, uh, first thing that happened to me during that boys that stood out in my mind was crossing the equator 
and uh, whenever you cross the equator, all the polywogs are subject to King, King Neptune's court, and uh, so the crew uh, would get out on deck, and they had these big things rigged up full of water, soapy water, and, and they'd roll up their pant legs if they weren't in shorts already, and they had mops on for wigs, and their faces all painted up, and liberal amounts of lipstick, and what have you, and they were dressed up as King Neptune and his court, and, and they would uh, unceremoniously uh, dunk and subject any polywog to whatever ridicule they could, and, uh, and uh, we all had a lot of fun doing that. So uh, after we crossed the equator, then we all uh, got our certificate of, uh, of initiation, and I guess that sort of gave us a feeling that now we were full-fledged seamen maybe at that point, I don't know. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, when we crossed the international date line, uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, it's one minute, it's, it's uh, Monday, and the next day it's uh, Tuesday already. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that was an interesting aspect, too. Uh, Can you remember what time of day that was? Was it day or night when you crossed it? Or? It, well, the ceremony was during the day. Now, whether it actually yeah, right. was or not, I, I don't know, but there was a, it was a half-day ceremony, and I, I, I took pictures of the thing, and I, I somewhere around I still have a lot of those little pictures. Do you still have your certificate? I doubt it, because actually uh, when I got back, uh, I, had, uh, I went to school. I was going to uh, pre-med school at Miami University in Oxford, and uh, I left all my clothing and everything that I had with my folks up in Wauseon, Ohio, and they had a, a big fire, mm -hmm. and the whole thing burned down, so mm -hmm. I lost everything. Mm -hmm. So I was really grateful to the uh, Coast Guard people when they, uh, when they sent me all these documents telling me which ship I was on and when, and, and uh, it, it, without that, I wouldn't be able to uh, give you as good a picture as, yeah. as I can give you here. But I guess uh, uh, the, the next big event that I recall was, and probably the biggest event from the whole time I spent, was uh, it was nighttime out in the South Pacific uh, with a full moon. You could read a newspaper out there that night, as I recall. And I, don't, I can't tell you which night it was because that, uh, I didn't write it down. I, I didn't keep a diary of it. But I'm sure the government can tell you somewhere because <laughs> uh, they have a lot of record of it. But anyway, uh, we were going along and uh, the, um, the uh, people on watch spotted a uh, phosphorescent torpedo trail coming at us. And uh, the ship was put into a hard right turn or left turn, I don't remember which at this point, but uh, the alarm was sounded and uh, with all the noise and everybody was up on deck and if you weren't at a gun you were uh, assigned to your station to either navigate the ship or whatever your job was on ship and otherwise you were assigned to a lifeboat and uh, we each had our jobs to do uh, with the lifeboat and we all stood around with our life jackets on which at the time seemed a little ridiculous because if anything hit, hit that ship there wouldn't be anything but a grease spot <laughs> left because we had nothing but ammunition and landing craft on that thing, and jeeps. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I remember I was so scared, it was the first time that I, I can actually remember being so scared that I was actually trembling all over, and, uh, and uh, I don't recall wetting my pants or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> it was a very, very uh, vivid uh, experience, and uh, uh, in any event, uh, as soon as the captain took over uh, from the mates uh, who were on watch at that time, uh, he put us on a zig what they call a zigzag course at that point. And uh, uh, actually all the, the gun crew were at their stations ready to, to start shooting at anything they could see or find, but we never saw anything. I'm sure the submarines could see us very well because it was so light. Uh, had, but in any event, uh, as the ship would go through the zigzag course, the uh, 
the gun crews would fire off either the three inch four cannon or if we were in position the five inch cannon in the direction from which the uh, torpedoes came. So we were firing and it seemed kind of silly because I didn't, I didn't, I don't know whether they were trying to scare off the submarine or what, but in any event, they, uh, they would do that. I don't recall that the 20 millimeters uh, were fired, but uh, we went through that and I think they spotted another torpedo and, and I don't know if it's for real or not, but I, I was on the starboard deck and I swore I saw a torpedo wake go by uh, while I was standing there by the lifeboat. But I don't know. Anyway, we uh, the next uh, the next thing I remember was uh, uh, the radio operator uh, reported that uh, apparently this same submarine was uh, shooting at another ship that was coming along behind us, and uh, I don't know whether the, the submarine sank the ship or or what happened, but apparently. Uh, the submarine was uh, shooting it out with the ship and had surfaced and they could uh, they could see each other and were shooting at each other. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether they ran out of, the sub ran out of torpedoes or, or what happened. But anyway, uh, when we got into Sydney, uh, which was probably 20, 30 days later, the Provost Marshal came on board and they grilled the uh, captain and, and all the officers uh, for all the details that they could get. And it was a one-way deal. I mean, they were quizzing us, and we never got any feedback as to who it was or when or whether they sank the thing or, or, or found it or not. Probably not because, you know, uh, I didn't hear of anything. We would have heard of SOS, I think, if, uh, if the ship behind us was sinking, and we didn't. But anyway, uh, the provost marshal from the, uh, I guess it's the army, uh, came on and got all the information from us, and, uh, uh, and we made it okay, obviously, to uh, to Sydney. So, boy, we all the crew all breathed a big sigh of relief when they unloaded every all the ordnance and jeeps and landing barges and everything else in uh, in Sydney, <coughs> because at that time they were fighting in New Guinea. So Australia was serving as a, a warehouse area, if you will, for the, the fighting forces uh, uh, up in, uh, in uh, New Guinea and those that were on the islands. <clears throat> so they unloaded us and, uh, and uh, started loading uh, piling on board. These are like big telephone poles. And the whole ship was loaded with those pilings. And, uh, and we l later learned that uh, these were for making uh, landing docks in uh, New Guinea, where we were heading. And uh, obviously there was no way for the ships to tie up or to uh, provide a place for uh, cargo to be unloaded in the islands. Everything was unloaded with, uh, with landing craft. It would pull up alongside the ship and you'd have your bumpers and hope to keep from damaging everything and the ship would use its own uh, winches and cranes to unload the cargo onto the, the landing vessels. <clears throat> so uh, uh, we had about a week in Liberty uh, for Liberty in Sydney as I remember and of course now we're in the southern hemisphere and uh, this would be about June <coughs> of 94 or uh, 1944, so we're talking about winter weather uh, in uh, in Sydney, but which seems strange because it was cool there, and you you went ashore wearing your your blues uh, uh, to keep warm in the evenings, and uh, and yet there were palm trees in, in Sydney, <laughs> and you know I thought, gee, this looks like it's tropical. Why would it be so cool here? But it was. It was. Uh, reminded me of, uh, of uh, a real cool spring, actually. So uh, after spending Liberty in uh, in Sydney, uh, and we were loaded, we we uh, uh, and I guess I should mention that we were we were in Sydney long enough that uh, 
we picked up about 10 cases of gonorrhea in the crew. <laughs> and so I had my hands full with, uh, with uh, some of the gunnery crew and, uh, and uh, some of our seamen. Uh, I was treating him with sulfonamides the best I could. And uh, at a subsequent date, I don't remember how long after that, they, uh, the Navy crew in particular, they unloaded them I, I don't know where they where they sent them, but the Navy crew were picked up by the Navy, and they took care of their their own cases. Their own <laughs> cases, and the cases that I had to deal with, we were stuck with until we got back to to stateside. But uh, I remember telling these guys to take their sulfonamides and try to stay out of the sunshine as much as possible, because if they got in the sunshine, they likely get some side effects and scrotum swelling and a few other side effects that they wouldn't like and uh, this was a paradox because these guys had to work on the sun. <laughs> no way, you know, you, you could keep from doing it. So I'd tell them but that was the end of the end You did your part. I did my part and that was that was about it. Uh, but after we uh, we loaded the uh, the uh, piling then we were uh, uh, for the CBs uh, to make landing docks we were sent to New Guinea. And uh, we went to a place called Milne Bay, and I've looked for it on the maps. I, I can't find it, but it's at the very south, southern tip of, of New Guinea. And back then, New Guinea was divided into two parts. Part of, half of it was Dutch New Guinea, and I don't remember who the other half belonged to, but we were in the, in the, in the part belonging to Holland. And uh, <clears throat> We uh, put into this Milne Bay, and it was uh, the fighting was going on just north of us. So we just laid there like a big warehouse, waiting to, to tell them tell that for them to tell us where to go with the piling to to unload it. And uh, uh, wasn't a whole lot there except army camp, and uh, I went ashore a couple three times uh, with. Uh, Navy crew wearing sidearms for protection to pick up the mail, a few things like that. And the only thing you'd see would be uh, military personnel. And occasionally you'd see a, a native with his bright red hair. And I found out later that this red hair came from eating beetle nuts. And beetle nuts has a red dye in it and they run their fingers through their hair and that's how they got the red hair. But these guys were supposed to be headhunters. And they didn't look like, I was very, say, they? They didn't look very <laughs> ferocious to me, but uh, uh, they uh, they were supposed to be in the, and we were warned not to, to mess around there at all. Uh, we didn't see any women, and I and I, we were told that the women were all up in the highlands that the, the headhunters had put their women up there to keep them away from the military personnel <laughs> while messing around. So that was the story we got, whether it was true or not, I don't know, but we never did see any women. Uh, I guess the one thing I should have mentioned while we were in port in Sydney was that uh, uh, most of the men that you would see would be in uniform, but there weren't a lot of men around. Practically all of them were up fighting uh, in, in the islands or north of there because remember the Japanese were <coughs> threatening Australia at that time. But uh, it, they were on a war footing and food was rationed. and. If you go into a bar, all you could get was what we call green beer. There wasn't any aged beer at all. It, it, I don't know whether it was being sent out or just wasn't available or whatever, but I remember it was all green beer and it was all hot. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was uh, something I remembered about Sydney. Anyway, we uh, 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 while we were also in Sydney, I the third mate and I purchased a little sailboat. It's a little thing, I guess it would be a one-man sail craft actually, but it had a little square thing about a foot or two in the, in the middle where the, uh, you'd put the centerboard down, close to where the centerboard went down. And uh, we bought this unfinished boat. And we got permission from the captain to uh, bring it on board. Mm. And we loaded it with the lifeboat davits and pulled it up on deck. And so one of the things that uh, the third mate and I did while we were 
journeying up the coast to uh, <coughs> to New Guinea was to finish this uh, boat and caulk it and do all that. And we had the sails and all that good stuff, and so uh, we had that on board to, to work on. Do you remember his name? The uh, third mate? Mm -hmm. No, I have no idea. I, I I can't remember any of those people's names because there were so many crews and so many. Well, I thought maybe since you you, you and know, he were in partners with this boat. Well, yeah, you think I would, but uh, actually I don't. In fact, I I know I sold my half to him, and I can't remember whether he stayed on board with the boat or what. I don't know what he did with it afterwards. Uh, it's really, really a mystery. But uh, anyway, we had that thing to work on. And I guess the other interesting thing is while we were going up to uh, Noni Bay in, in, uh, in New Guinea was that uh, we were going up the east coast of Australia and we were ordered to stay as close to shore as possible uh, to stay out of submarine uh, um, uh, areas and uh, and we did but uh, unfortunately the, the, the ship went aground on the coral reefs mm. uh, up near Brisbane and so we laid there for a day or so and finally they sent out some tugs and stuff from Brisbane and they were able to pull us off of the the reef, I guess, at high tide or something. I don't know. Anyway, we got off and and uh, proceeded on up uh, to Milne Bay. Then, so that was quite an event. There wasn't any damage. Uh, <coughs> significant damage. That I can't say, but I that brings us to a point which I'll mention here in a little bit. Excuse me. Uh, so after laying for several weeks uh, there in in. Uh, in Milne Bay, we were told to uh, to go up to uh, Hollandia, Dutch New Guinea, where this and this was just below where the fighting was at, and they had just cleared that out. And uh, we pulled in there, and there were uh, some Navy vessels in the uh, in the bay there. Uh, they were small ships, so I assume they were destroyer escorts. There was no docking there at all, <clears throat> and the Navy vessels that were in there would put out anchors fore and aft, and uh, and they tie up to each other, so you'd have a, a row of, of uh, battleships or <coughs> DE escorts all, all in a row here tied together and anchored there in the bay. And by the same token, there was no place for us to, to, to dock this huge Liberty ship, but all we had was piling, so we weren't that low in the water. But they would, uh, what I said, tie it up to a palm tree and then drop an anchor off uh, the bow, and, and that's what, what held us there. But we, uh, again, they would come in and they'd unload us uh, using our own cranes and uh, uh, to uh, put the piling into the landing craft and then they'd take it ashore and then they, the Seabees were, were building these piers and, and docks uh, in Hollandia at that time. Uh, actually, uh, after we uh, unloaded, we were scheduled to uh, to uh, uh, get ready to go to the Philippines invasion, at least that's what we were told. They were getting ready to invade the Philippines at that time. And uh, um, because of the incident that we had uh, down on the, the reef, uh, they sent Navy divers down to inspect the, the uh, hull of the vessel and we found out that the hull was all buckled underneath. Now they think that the buckle was not due to the reef, but the fact that we were laying in this harbor, and when the tide went out, we settled down on some big heavy rocks, boulders or whatever down there, and that just caused the, the ship to, to buckle. So they scratched us from the, the, uh, the Philippine invasion, and they said, we'll send you back to dry dock stateside. Well, they didn't know how to do that because they couldn't put any cargo on of any significance and they, uh, so they put as much seawater in as ballast as they felt that they dared to without endangering the, the ship and uh, uh, causing it to buckle. Buckle this way, I guess. I, I'm not clear on just what all it was, but anyway, we took on seawater as a result. We were just, like a balloon floating on water. It was, you know, this huge warehouse. Um, and we were going out of uh, Hollandia 
and we were heading toward this row of DES courts, and we had to make a turn, <coughs> turn to go out of the, the bay. And uh, when the captain gave the orders for the to make a, a left rudder or whatever, I think it was a left rudder, uh, the ship wouldn't respond because the wind caught us, and the and and the props were just turning, but the ship just wouldn't, you know, because the wind was blowing us this way, and we were trying to go the other way. It, it, the ship wouldn't respond, so the, the the captain put it in reverse rudder or reverse engines to try and stop it because we were heading right for these <laughs> DEs. And boy, talk about people scrambling! <laughs> you should have seen these sailors on the DE. They all they were all running for the for the last ship uh, that was uh, the furthest away from us, and uh, we eased, just came up and just eased up to the first first one and put a little put a big notch in first one he didn't sink but I'm sure uh, there was enough damage there that he probably couldn't do a whole lot of mm -hmm. uh, after that I don't know whether the Navy was able to repair it or not but we backed out of there somehow and, and got out to, onto the ocean and, and uh, <laughs> get out of town huh? got out of town yeah and it took us 30 days to, to go from Hollandia to uh, to uh, Seattle and again, you know, we're at the mercy of the wind and the waves, and uh, and uh, you're always you always have swells, so the ship is always going up and down, and every time the ship would come out, of that prop would come out of the water, and it would just vibrate the whole ship, and it just shake the bejeepers out of it. So there was no way that uh, you could sit down and eat any hot food or anything. We ate cold cuts uh, all the way across, and you know, a cup of coffee was almost in very difficult to drink. You had to hold it constantly and you probably spilled a lot of it as it was. But anyway, it took us 30 days to, to get back to uh, to Seattle with that uh, with that ride, uh, ride and it was, a, it was a rough one. But we got back without breaking up and that was the thing we were holding our breath, hoping the thing would hold together long enough to get us back stateside. And, uh, and uh, fortunately we, we got her back okay. Um, uh, I guess uh, when we were about a, uh, well, yeah, about a week's out, uh, this is my first experience uh, with making out a payroll. I had to get everything together and prepare the payroll. And the payroll, a payroll sheet was like a big spreadsheet. It was, I guess, maybe 36 by 36, something like that enough rows that you could have at least a crew of 40 or more on there and each line was a crewman and each column had a, uh, a pay item, either uh, uh, something that had an expenditure that had to be deducted from his pay or a tax withheld or something. And uh, all that calculation had to be put in there so you would balance the thing across and then you would balance it down this way. So you get totals down this way and you get totals this way and all of that had to, to balance. So we used cal a little hand calculator to, to do all that. I mean, we didn't have electronic calculators. You don't, did it all by adding in your head or using that electric adding machine. And uh, so <clears throat> I had to have that thing ready so that when we got into port, it would be ready to turn over to the uh, to the payroll department to check my uh, my calculations, but I remember coming in. Um, we went past through the Straits of Juan de Fuca uh, outside of Seattle uh, in October of '44, uh, and it was uh, it was really foggy and you couldn't see anything. And we had fog horns sounding uh, with the ships, so you were really going in almost blind, and they were just using those fog horns to try and keep from colliding with anything. And uh, anyway, we got the ship into to Seattle and then we took it over to Bremerton and they put it into to dry dock. And uh, I took all my uh, payroll data. Well, I, I had to inventory the slop chest to see what I had left and balance all that out and get all the records put together. And I take it into the uh, payroll department at the Griffith Steamship uh, line and they would check my figures and when they got everything to their satisfaction, why they would uh, uh, go to the bank and, and get a payroll together. And this was cash, 
no checks, everything was in cash. And you'd have suitcases full of bills of all denominations and, and this big payroll. <coughs> and uh, um, the captain and I, and uh, sometimes uh, I think they'd have a representative from the steamship company was there also. And we'd come on board ship and we'd win the mess hall. And uh, the crew would come in one by one. The captain sat here and, and uh, uh, he'd say, uh, Jones, uh, messman or whatever he was, uh, uh, here's what you got coming. You can look at it if you want to to see whether you object to anything. And if you don't object, uh, sign here. And that was signing off. Essentially, that's what they call signing off the articles, but he was signing the payroll. Mm -hmm. and the captain would sit there and count out his pay for him, and he'd take it in his sea bag and go ashore. And, uh, and that was the, the end of that for, for that crew. Now, if you were going to, in this case, it was going into dry dock, so that ship was out of commission for how long? I don't know whether they ever, I assume they got it repaired at some point. But uh, the crew all disperse, and they go to, the hall where the seamen uh, got would get the uh, openings that were available, and then they get their next ship ship out. In my case, uh, I was tied in with the uh, shipping company, so I was responsible to them. So I went to the home office, and that's where I stayed until I was assigned to another ship and, and uh, shipped out. How so, excuse me? How how long would it normally take for a turnaround from the time you submitted your payroll records until? The fellows were paid off. Oh, I'd say a couple within days or? no more than two days, probably within a day or so. It would take about a day <coughs> in the office, home office, get, to get, to get, get restless. Get. Oh yeah, the crew, the crew was ready to. They were ready to get out of there. They you guys were gone five, almost six five months. months, twenty-five days on that yeah, trip, six which was almost six months. And yeah. Seemed like an eternity to me at, at eighteen years old. First assignment. <coughs> first assignment. Yeah, and a real, real experience for the for the first first time out. Uh, uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> the next assignment that I had was uh, was to report to the New York office of the American President Lines, uh, who was the port agent for the Griffith Line in New York. Uh, and there I was assigned to catch uh, uh, a ship called the SS Jonathan Edwards. I think it's another it was another Liberty ship uh, with a Captain D. McCona, McDonough, and uh, <clears throat> we signed on a crew December 13th, uh, 1944, and we we left New York. We went down the East Coast to somewhere Virginia, Maryland, somewhere along in that area. I don't, I can't tell you where exactly, uh, where we would join a convoy, and I. My guesstimate is that convoy was at least 50 to 100 ships in there. It was huge. As far as the eye could see, it's nothing but ships. And uh, you had destroyer escorts uh, going along the, the, the boundaries of the, uh, of the convoy. They formed like a big square, and uh, you'd have uh, DE uh, drop and depth charges uh, all the way across the Atlantic. And then they'd, they'd, they'd do it along the the uh, uh, one side, and then they'd drop back, and they'd fall behind and drop them along uh, the rear of the of the uh, convoy, and uh, that's the way we crossed the uh, the Atlantic. Now we uh, went across the Humboldt Current, so it was winter when we left. But when you get into that warm Gulf or uh, yeah, warm Gulf Stream, uh, everything warmed up, and, and it was bright and balmy and, and, and then we and we were going in a south southeast a south uh, easterly direction as I remember but it was fairly calm weather compared to the North Atlantic the North Atlantic was was wicked in the winter time and I was and of course we were going out in December so I was thankful <laughs> that we were crossing uh, in uh, more southerly route so that we had some decent weather but it was it was still pretty rough and uh, 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 the ship was outfitted to had been converted to carry troops, and uh, I remember the the I felt so sorry for the for the troops because they were up on deck or 
down and below, <laughs> whooping it up, uh, uh, barfing it up, I should say. And, and uh, it was was wasn't long between the voyages I was on, so I I, I wasn't suffering too badly. It, it, even then, it took a day or so to get your sea legs uh, again after you've been off ship for a couple of weeks or more. These people, though, they were the responsibility of the military, not not your. Not mine. That's, That's right. right. They had their own commanders yeah. on board uh, and everything. It was like, you know, hey, they're we're here and they're they're there. And uh, we still had a gun crew though, and uh, but uh, the gun crew we didn't depend on like we did in the South Pacific. They they uh, uh, they uh, had a less important role there because they were depending more on the escorts, uh, destroyer escorts, mm -hmm. for protection there. And uh, <clears throat> after we got across to, to the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, uh, we, went, we went into uh, Iran, North Africa, and unloaded uh, the troops that we had. And then we, uh, we uh, took on board troops from the North Africa Corps, or whatever military engagement was. I couldn't tell you who they were because we weren't allowed to to, to intermingle with the, with the troops. They were kept pretty much to themselves. And uh, we, were, we were assigned to transport them up to uh, Italy at that point. And uh, uh, we were only in port for a few days and I never did get ashore. Uh, they told us that it wasn't safe for, uh, for more than three or four uh, sailors to go ashore together. Uh, these uh, Arabs would love to touch you up pretty badly if, and rob you if they could. So we were scared enough that <laughs> hardly, I don't remember anybody going ashore in Iran, North Africa. That sounded like a pretty tough place to me from the description they gave us. So, and, and this was wartime besides, so I never did go ashore there. Um, we went across the Mediterranean, and when we got up close to, to Italy, uh, they put uh, minesweepers up in front of us because uh, the Mediterranean was full of land or uh, sea, uh, sea mines uh, that had been planted by the Germans and Italians, apparently. <coughs> and uh, so we we stayed in behind the minesweeper as we went up the coast. And we went to uh, Naples. We didn't stay very long in Naples, uh, and I'm not sure what we did in Naples. Uh, but we got, we were in the harbor long enough to uh, I could see the the shoreline and the buildings, and it was the buildings looked like you took a, a, a knife and just went right down through it and cut off half of the building and and, and pulled it away. And here exposed, you'd see all these rooms of all the building and much like that building uh, that we saw in uh, uh, bombed in uh, in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City. where you know all the front end of the buildings open you look into each of the rooms and that's the way the whole waterfront looked uh, mm. in, uh, in Naples Italy and it wasn't I didn't uh, it was uh, fairly devastating and uh, the front at that time <coughs> was just north of the Livorno or pizza as we call it Italy, and the Germans were uh, were uh, uh, trying to hold back the Americans who were fighting their way up the Italian uh, peninsula. So we landed uh, in uh, Laverno and unloaded the, the troops, and uh, we were permitted to go ashore because the front was several miles north of us, and. Uh, I remember there was nothing standing there in the way of buildings. Although this is pizza, I don't remember the Leaning Tower being destroyed. I don't think it was. I don't remember ever hearing about it. But where we were located, there wasn't a building standing. It was one building standing that hadn't been bombed. <coughs> and the Americans had taken it over and it was an officer's club. And it was the only place that you could go to, to get beer or whatever you wanted uh, uh, in, uh, in that part of Italy. So uh, we went ashore and uh, wandered around a little bit and then went back to the ship. And we were, <coughs> the thing that struck me was the fact that all these Italians were uh, 
really destitute. The kids didn't have shoes and clothing was tattered and they were begging us for shoes or any kind of clothing that we could uh, we could give up. And they wanted to trade uh, what I thought was beautiful pieces of alabaster, which was noted for that region, uh, statues and vases and what have you for cigarettes. Hmm. Or and, and then they could trade the cigarettes for things that they needed. Sure. There was no cash transaction that was in cigarettes. So needless to say, all of my stores disappeared in a hurry. <laughs> so they'd, they'd buy them up and then they'd use them to trade for whatever they, whatever they wanted. But uh, <clears throat> uh, after we got rid of the, uh, the cargo and, uh, and uh, we left uh, Laverno, I don't think we were there all that long, we uh, went back down the coast uh, and uh, picked up a convoy that was supposed to head out through the Straits uh, to go back to New York, and uh, we no long, we had no we had no sooner gotten through the Straits of Gibraltar than our engines quit, and uh, we were close enough in that you get these huge land swells, so the ship just laid there and rocked, and we didn't have any cargo, of course, so we were pretty high out of the water, and uh, it was pretty nasty, but the. Uh, the crew worked on those engines, I guess, a couple of days. They finally got them going and got everything ship shape again. And, and I, I can't remember. The, I don't think the convoy waited on us. I think we must have picked up another another convoy or something. But anyway, we got into another convoy and headed back to to New York, and and uh, and we docked in New York. Uh, the date I have is March 22nd, 1945. And that day, uh, that voyage lasted three months and ten days, so it was a relatively short, short trip. Uh, uh, we went through the same procedures that I described before and signing the crew off and everything, and uh, only this time we were in the port of New York, and, uh, and I worked through the American President lines to, to complete everything. And then I learned that I was to be sent to the West Coast again to pick up another ship, and I think I stopped off home and and uh, then went on out to the uh, uh, West Coast. I learned later uh, from the FBI uh, on interrogation when I came in from the next voyage, in, when I returned to uh, Seattle, that uh, somebody, after we reached port, had broken into the, uh, the small stores and carted off all the, uh, the small stores that, that we had, uh, slop chest. So the FBI had, uh, had learned when I was going to be in, uh, in Seattle. <laughs> and they were waiting. This was several months later that, that they came in. And I didn't know what the heck was going on. And they took me downtown to the FBI office and sat me down and started grilling me about this and that, and asking all these questions. Where were all the candy bars? <laughs> yeah, I had no idea what the heck they were talking about. And finally, uh, finally, I learned that, uh, that that's what had happened. Somebody had broken in, and they wanted to know if what details I could give them to help them to solve that crime. I doubt if they ever solved it, but nevertheless, it, they made a big deal out of it. And uh, and uh, my folks told me later that they even visited my folks in Wauseon. Is that right? Uh, and, and grilled them. Extensively. See if you ship anything home. I guess I don't know. I never found out what all they asked them, but they uh, they told me about it, and uh, I guess they had my folks worried for a while. Uh, my next ship uh, uh, was, uh, of course, right after uh, my next long three-day journey across the country in a car, setting up all the way from New York to to uh, to Wauseon and on to Chicago and. Seattle. By automobile you went back to Seattle? No, by train. Oh, okay. Everything was by train. Okay. No, back in those days it was, you could travel everywhere by train or bus if, if you couldn't get a train there. And uh, I was assigned to a Captain Arnie Munson uh, on the SS Morton McCarver. Um, I'm not sure, but I think it was a victory ship. A uh, victory ship was a, a later 
cargo ship that was built by the, uh, the government. It, it had a speed about 22 knots, as I recall. And, uh, anybody that traveled on the Liberty ship couldn't wait to get on something like a, a victory ship. It was slimmer looking. It didn't look like a big warehouse. And it, Looked like it would. Uh, it had a lot more speed and maneuverability, <clears throat> and I think the MacArthur was a uh, was a victory ship, but I'm not. I wouldn't swear to that. But anyway, uh, we signed on a crew in April, April 27, 1945, and uh, the ship proceeded to Pearl Harbor. Now I can't remember <clears throat> why we went into Pearl, but we were there for. Uh, I guess three or four days. Now, whether we took on cargo from Seattle to to Pearl or not, I, I, I can't remember. But the thing that sticks out in my mind is that uh, I had a friend, a close close friend that I went to school with, who was a Marine, and us. And how I learned about it, I I can't, I don't know, but I learned somehow that he was in a Marine rest camp on the big island of Hawaii. And as I, they had this island up in the, way up on top of the, one of the mountains there, volcanoes. And it was all volcanic rock everywhere around there. And uh, they would bring <coughs> Marines back from the South Pacific and they'd stay there for a while and then they'd ship them back out again. <coughs> Most of those guys were really in bad shape. But, uh, I remember I, I, I got a plane ride on a Navy plane from Pearl going over to Hilo, and then I hitched a ride on a Marine mail truck going up to this uh, rest camp, and I got to spend about a half a day with uh, this friend of mine uh, while he was there. Oh, and this was a close guy I played basketball with when I was in high school, so it was kind of an emotional, emotional thing. Uh, um, he made it through the war. I know he went back into battle again later, uh, and I know he made it through. Um, I don't think I ever met the guy um, later, and I don't know to this day whether he's still alive or whether he died shortly after he got back to the States. What's his name now? Oh, I knew you'd ask me that. Uh, that I can't, okay. I can't recall, but he was from Wauseon. He was, we had a group of three or four guys that were all real close sure. that were on the basketball team and we all chummed around together. Right. And he was right. he was one that was in the Marines. But anyway, to finish that story, after I got through uh, visiting with my friend uh, at, the, at the rest camp, of course I had to get back to the ship, so uh, I got a ride on a mail truck going back down to Hilo. <coughs> and there was a, a Marine lieutenant uh, came up to the mail truck and he said, uh, he says, I'll tell you what guys, I'll give you a, a pint of Southern Comfort if you'll watch after this case of Southern Comfort and see that it gets to some place in, uh, in Hilo for me. So we said, oh sure, that's a good deal. And uh, so we took off down the hill. Now I should preface that by saying that on that ride from Hilo up to the camp, I'd have to say that was the bumpiest ride I had ever made in my whole life because, you know, this is all volcanic rock and the roads were rough and these were jeeps or mail trucks, whatever, with not uh, with heavy springs in them and boy, we just about killed you. But going back down, I don't remember a thing. <laughs> <laughs> we won't ask why. <laughs> I, I, I have to tell you, I, I remember waking up in, a, in some hotel or latrine somewhere, heaving up my guts and wondering what in heaven's name or where I was. And somehow I got from that latrine back on board ship and I have no idea to this day how I got back. I suspect the MPs probably, or SP, uh, got me back somehow to the, to the ship. But... Uh, that was uh, that was something else, and, and the trouble is that was the first time I ever drank Southern Comfort in my life, and that stuff just went down. You didn't know the difference. You think you were drinking <laughs> soda pop, and they, I had two other Marines in that truck with myself, <laughs> and we finished that bottle off before we got back to Elo, and, and uh, that was that. Anyway, uh, um, uh, 
we left, uh, I got back on board ship and uh, we left Anahuitoc and again without any escort. Uh, we went to Anahuitoc Atoll and of course that's a very memorable place now because that's where they exploded one of the uh, atomic bombs. But back then that was a place where they collected ships and then you would lay there at anchor until you were told where to, to take your cargo. Could I ask, uh, can you share anything about Pearl, what, what you saw there? I remember uh, uh, the sunken, a lot of the sunken vessels there. I didn't uh, have an opportunity to, to go in where the, uh, the memorials are now in, in right, Pearl, in that, right. where the Arizona was sunk and so forth. But uh, it was a mess. and. It's so long ago that sure, it, sure. Well, I didn't know. If, I didn't know if you actually, your ship actually went in to Battleship Row, or whether they kept you out of the harbor. No, we went. We actually went into Pearls because I, I know I didn't go by landing craft into the into into uh, into uh, Honolulu. Mm -hmm. I think we were in Honolulu and not in Pearl Harbor. Actually, Pearl is right next to. Well, yeah, it's about 20 miles north. About 20 miles. But, and we were in Honolulu, actually. I said Pearl, but that's where I caught the airplane okay. from wherever there's an airport, Navy airport there somewhere where I caught the airplane over to the big island. Then you did go by landing craft off your ship to... Could be. I'm not really sure. sure. That's, well, uh, even in that's Pearl, I guess they, you could use a landing craft or one of those commuter boat or whatever. Well, actually, we were in Honolulu and not in Pearl Harbor because okay. we, I think we left off some cargo there or took on cargo. That's all pretty vague to me right sure, now. Sure. I, I can't recall what, what we did then. Sure. Okay. Anyway, after we left there, we went to this uh, Anahuitoc Atoll, which is out in the middle of the Pacific, and uh, we just laid there at anchor for a heck of a long time, and it was, uh, oh, this is probably May, June, April, May, June. Parade was hot as blazes there. And uh, I remember it being so blasted hot and it was, uh, and actually when you go ashore to one of these atolls, it was nothing but a bar of sand. And uh, the Navy would have uh, these tin huts set up there and then they'd have a huge mountain of beer <laughs> stacked up, uh, cases of beer that, uh, uh, they would use to uh, to send out to the ships that were were anchored there, and uh, we did go ashore there to pick up mail and and uh, from the uh, uh, um, from the navy. And again, all our mail went through what is it, fleet post office or what you used to address it, FPO, FPO or something, San Francisco or New York, whichever way direction mm -hmm. you were going and. Then you'd pick it up wherever you could, where you could, and I don't know how the Navy, well, I guess they knew where the ships were going and they kept track of all of them, so they'd have it available and you could pick it up and drop yours off. But anyway, we went, a, went ashore there and uh, um, the other thing that was uh, memorable about that area was um, uh, uh, we had been uh, unloading some cargo from the uh, into some landing craft, and I think it was at Anahuitaco Atoll. I wouldn't swear to this, it might have been at some other place we were at, but anyway, while the Army was unloading uh, one of the, uh, uh, and, and again, it's either Anahuitaco or later on uh, in Okinawa, I don't know, and I'll get to that later, but it was at one of these places where uh, uh, the Army was on board unloading Army or CBs, and I never can be sure which, were uh, uh, unloading this cargo into the landing craft, and one of the seamen or one of the uh, Army personnel fell from the top deck clear down into the hold. And uh, of course, all I had in the sick bay was some, we had some limited amount of morphine, and, and uh, that was about it. And, uh, we hauled the guy up out of there, and I, I, I did what I could, and then they finally transported the poor guy uh, off onto a, a vessel to try and get him into uh, some some doctor somewhere. Um, the the most memorable event besides that one was uh, 
a sailor that we had who uh, started screaming and pulling, holding on to his side that he had, and I thought he had appendicitis because he had all, all the symptoms of it. And I thought, oh my God, I've heard all these stories about uh, getting direction over radio to operate for <laughs> appendicitis. And I thought, I hope to God I don't have to do something like that. But it, it turned out uh, we, uh, we sent out a radio message of, of our problem and they gave us directions to, uh, to load the guy onto uh, one of the uh, uh, lifeboats. And we took him over to uh, another vessel that had a doctor on board and uh, they treated him. And I later found out the guy had kidney stones. Oh. And, but the poor guy, every time the boat would rock or hit a rough point, man, the poor guy would scream holler and carry on something fierce. But uh, that I'll never forget. Anyway, we had a few of those kind of incidents that, uh, that took place. I guess one of the other things to point out during that period is, you know, a ship coming from Seattle or San Francisco or any of the most recent ports would, uh, would load up with all kinds of meat and vegetables as much as they could. And we'd take on more meat than we'd ever consume. And when we'd get to a place like you know, we talk <clears throat> or somewhere in the islands, uh, we'd, uh, we'd transport a lot of that food to uh, Army or Navy personnel. And uh, uh, that got to be quite a thing. So, uh, and then there was a certain amount of uh, trading that took place uh, in the South Pacific. And you, having been in Honolulu, you remember these little shells that they had that they make necklaces out of sure. in Honolulu. Those were all over the South Pacific and guys that with rings and and uh, arm bracelets were a big thing, you know, they make out of silver and, and out of coins and things like that. And uh, Marines and soldiers and Navy were always trying to trade you something for that. So there was a lot of bartering going on back in those days. Uh, I have a note here that the war in Europe ended on May 7, 1945, while we were in the Pacific, and as near as I can figure, we were probably pretty close to Anahuita Atoll when that happened. So that was the European theater, and we learned about it, of course, over the radio. And, uh, and, and obviously the Japanese war was, was still underway. Um, so after what seemed to be an eternity, and, and we talked, we were ordered to Buckner Bay, Okinawa, Japan. And uh, uh, we put into to, uh, Buckner Bay, which is on the eastern side of the island, <coughs> and uh, laid an anchor there. And there were a lot of Navy ships in there. And uh, we were told that there were some carrier, there was a carrier or two in there even. Uh, whether there were or weren't, I don't know. But the one thing I do know is that uh, we saw a lot of uh, Japanese kamikaze dive bombers while we were there, and they were coming in uh, hot and heavy, and um, and uh, there were all kinds of anti-aircraft fire at them, so they were shrapnel all over the place. So the only safe place to stand was underneath the uh, the uh, overhang where the uh, captain would take his or the mates would take their sights. It comes out from the bridge. Or the bridge. And if you stood underneath, and we always had to wear helmets and so forth, uh, you'd sit there and watch all the fireworks going What are you doing out there? Yeah. <laughs> Idiot. I was, you got to remember, I'm, right. I'm 19 <laughs> years old at this point in time. I'd be after too. And uh, I did a lot of stupid things back then, <laughs> some of which I'll relate to you. But anyway, uh, that's the big thing that I remember with these kamikaze bimers. And they told me they were coming in after the carriers and the, and the destroyers and the bigger Navy ships. They weren't messing around. How far do you like suppose us. you were from that action? We were right there. You could see them coming in. I mean, was but it half a mile or a mile? Or oh, I would imagine so. Next yeah. ship over? Or? Well, I don't know about the next ship over. We could see the vessels right. that they were going after, let's put it that way. Uh, you can see for uh, seven miles at sea, so I'd say we were probably within three miles anyway of where uh, a lot of this was going on. Uh, and there was shrapnel falling all over the place. You had to be very, very careful. And uh, we, even our own gun crew, were out ready to to go at it and participating in it. So it was 
We stayed there for a while and got rid of our cargo, and I don't remember uh, what all we had, but again, we unloaded most of it, I think, with uh, landing barges. And it could be that's where the, uh, the, 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 uh, the CB or soldier uh, fell into the hold. I'm not really certain. It all kind of runs together after a while. Uh, but while we were there, <clears throat> I did go ashore, and I went ashore with the uh, guys that were going to pick up the mail. Again, uh, we'd go ashore with a couple of Navy people who had wore sidearms and, uh, and, and pick up the mail. And where we went into, and this is one of my stupid things, uh, and I can't remember what was the third mate or radio operator. Those are the guys I usually hung out with most of the time. And they were about my age. And I were uh, climbing around in the hills there in Okinawa, and there were these little excavations inside the, the hill there and we look inside and we'd see these urns in there and uh, we came back we didn't touch anything but we were just walking around or looking around we came back and we found out that these were uh, burial sites where the Okinawans would you know they cut up their dead corpses and put them in these uh, urns and they took a di very dim view of of Americans messing around with that area and we were probably lucky to come out of there alive or uninjured but we did and I, I chalked that up to one of my bits of youthful ignorance uh, but anyway uh, one of the stupid things I did while I was was there <clears throat> and uh, uh, we didn't spend uh, I'd say we were in Okinawa maybe a week or so something like that I, I, I don't I, I can't recall, I could probably, if I knew when they dropped the atomic bomb, I could probably tell you better because I could relate to that. But anyway, we, uh, 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 in fact, I have in my notes here that this is where the soldier fell from the upper deck, and I'm sure that's where it was because I know there was a Navy craft there where we were able to take the guy. Uh, after leaving Buckner Bay, we headed toward the Philippines, and we didn't know where we were going. <clears throat> but uh, we were, I guess, two or three or four days out of, out of uh, Buckner Bay when we heard over the radio that an atomic bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima, or Hiroshima. And uh, uh, to this day, I can remember how I, 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 I was just dumbfounded that this was something you read about in comic books, that, you know, it wasn't real. And there was no way that we could have possibly done something like develop a, an atomic bomb. But uh, we heard uh, we heard the report that that had happened, and then you would have thought the war was over at that point because we, we, we like the reports were that you know probably the war wouldn't last long. But anyway, uh, we heard uh, reports of enemy vessels firing, uh, being fired upon uh, by the Japanese, uh, I guess submarines. Uh, so they weren't giving up at that point, and uh, uh, we didn't go into the Philippines, but we headed uh, east then and went uh, went back to the states, and uh, we went back into Seattle. I think that voyage took us four months and fifteen days uh, after leaving Seattle in April. So we. Uh, we signed the crew off on September 11th, uh, 1945. And after I completed that uh, voyage on the, on the MacArthur, I was promoted to a chief purser, pharmacist mate, with a uh, full uh, lieutenant rank in the U.S. Maritime Service. Um, and uh, I should say that the war with Japan ended September 2nd while we were en route back to uh, Seattle on the, on the Carver, so we signed off on September 11th, and the war ended September 2nd. Mm -hmm. So we must have been what seven days mm -hmm. out of Seattle when, uh, when the World War, war with Japan ended. Uh, after we arrived in Seattle, I spent the next 20 days uh, in the Griffith office or thereabouts, and was assigned to uh, <laughs> MV Daystar, which was a Norwegian icebreaker. The interesting thing about it, the ships that we had for World War II 
were the U.S. merchant ships that we had and any ships that defected from uh, uh, the European countries like Norway and Denmark and Thereabout. And this uh, MV Daystar, which is a, a, a diesel engine, that was the first ship I was on with a diesel engine. It was a bigger ship too, by the way, and had a lot more speed. Uh, was uh, was an icebreaker, a Norwegian icebreaker, and the captain and uh, chief engineer and a few of his crew defected uh, when the Germans uh, took over, and they came over to the U.S. And so he was out in uh, Seattle at that time. His name was Captain Jens Christensen, huh. and he had a, a chief engineer that was as as, uh, as much of a Norwegian as he was, and those guys had their their uh, dried mackerel every morning, or smoked herring, I guess they was, and uh, they were a good crew. They had a, they were very jovial, and yeah, broken accent, but uh, really a, a great crew. Um, <clears throat> I remember this ship, uh, I didn't have to perform uh, much in the way of a pharmacist mate duty because they had a, a Navy doctor on board because this was a troop ship, and uh, this is the first time I had a had a Navy doctor on board, and I could breathe a sigh of relief because I was always worried about whether well, I was doing the right thing for these poor slobs. And, where were you headed? Uh, I don't know where we went, but we went somewhere in the in the Pacific, and then we ended up in. Well, uh, you didn't make a, another crossing in the Pacific. We went somewhere, but I'll be danged if I can remember where we we went and that sounds crazy Jerry but I'm going from the records sure, absolutely. and uh, I would have swore that most of the things that happened on the McCarver happened with the the, the MV Daystar sure. but when I can't I can't refute sure, what, yeah. the, what they what they what they have in Washington and uh, they said in Washington that uh, this was a uh, trip of a little over a month uh, Let's see, we, we uh, okay, the crew was signed on November 16th, 1945, and the voyage was completed when we signed off the crew in Los Angeles, California, one month and 15 days later. Oh, so that's so six weeks. That's six weeks. So that's over nine. We, we may have gone to Hawaii, or we may have gone to one of the islands or something. I, I really... I'm at a loss as to, uh, I remember the ship, in fact I could remember the ship and I couldn't recall the name of the uh, McCarver to be honest about you, and yet that's, sure. that's, sure. that's the way it works I guess. But anyway, uh, we went back to, uh, to, Los, uh, to Los Angeles uh, and signed off the crew and uh, uh, while I was there I was uh, uh, assigned to the Port Purser's office in San Pedro, California for uh, several weeks. I guess I was there for a couple of months and the American President Lines wanted me to go to work for them after the war was over as a purser on their around the world ships. So I had to decide whether I was going to do that or come back and go to school which is what I had planned to do in the first place and I said well thank you I'll, uh, I'll go back and I as they say, they used to say on board ship, you want to pick up an anchor and head inland until they don't know what it is, and that's where you want to stop and live. <laughs> so that's what I did, and I came back and uh, went into pre-med uh, at Miami University in, uh, uh, in the fall of uh, 45. And that's about it. I think my trip from Los Angeles <clears throat> uh, back to Wauseon was my last trip, train trip across the country. Hmm. But I made enough of them. That <laughs> <laughs> now I just have a couple questions I'd like to okay. ask. Uh, when you enlisted in the Merchant Marines, were you aware of the number of ships that were being sunk off the U.S. coast? I knew that it was risky business, but I didn't know that it was as bad as, as it was. I, I really began to find out how rough it was uh, when I got to New York, where most of the ships were going out to make what they called the Merman's Run. And this was a, a run up through the North Atlantic, the North Sea, and the submarines were picking them off right and left. It was a, they got a bunch of them. So it was pretty common knowledge, but when you're 18 and 19 yeah. years old, sure. you're not scared of anything, sure. Jerry. Sure. And 
until that first torpedo, believe me, I didn't know what it was like to be that scared. You know, like you, you mentioned the Wolfpack, when you made that crossing in the Pacific in your uh, uh, group of ships, the convoy went across. Well, that was in the Atlantic only. In the Atlantic, right. right. Did uh, you experience any of the uh, German submarines in the Wolfpack? Or? We knew they were there, but uh, we didn't see them. It, it was, you just knew they were there, and, uh, okay. uh, and you just hoped that your engines kept turning over and you didn't have to drop out of the, out of the convoy. Okay. And I was surprised too, I think I mentioned this to you before, about the number of ships that were being sunk off the U.S. coast here by the uh, German subs uh, down in the Florida Keys and off California and also off uh, Virginia. Uh, that was quite an eye yeah, there was a fair yeah. number of them. I, there were an awful lot of seamen lost. How many, I don't know, but I know there was. It wasn't something that was highly publicized, Jerry. You didn't hear much about it because it was kind of a silent service. It was one of those things we worked for the government, but at the same time we weren't part of the armed services. We didn't carry pistols and rifles and guns. Uh, we just operated the ships and saw that, you know, we were the warehouses for laying there at anchor to supply the, the troops and the Marines and uh, the Navy for whatever they needed. Well, I understand being quiet about that also helped the uh, recruitment because uh, they didn't want to publicize the number of probably, ships that were being lost probably so. on a weekly probably or monthly so. basis, which was astronomical, really. I think I read in one uh, place that they were losing 30 ships a, a month. Could be, or maybe could very well week. be, could very well be, Jerry. Because I remember when uh, the recruits at uh, Sheepshead Bay were all 18-year-olds like myself for the most part. They, I mean, we were all wet behind the ears. And so naive and sure. innocent. I mean, what can you expect from a kid that's lived all his life in a little town of 4,000 people? And, and uh, uh, it, was a, it was a new experience, I'll tell you. It was like a whirlwind, actually. You know, I just. How is there anything else you'd like to state, make a comment? Oh, I know you asked me if I ever saw any signs of Kilroy. <laughs> I'll have to say I saw a lot of signs of Kilroy throughout the Pacific. I don't remember seeing them so much in the Atlantic, but uh, in the Atlantic theater. But man, you'd see them all over the Pacific everywhere you go. <laughs> Kilroy was here, and. Uh, and as far as dress goes, uh, we wore khaki uniforms most of the time. And being in the South Pacific, we lived in shorts, sure. shorts, and probably no shirt for the most most part. We wear an, an officer's cap, but that was that was about it. Um, um, we spent most of our times anchored somewhere in the islands, off of an island somewhere. And uh, I've often thought I would like to go back. Uh, and uh, take a trip, but we've never, never, never done it. I, I got on a map one time, and I, I learned that I, if I could have sailed from, from Italy, the, the longitude for Italy, to the uh, Okinawa, I would have gotten around the world, which encompasses the Far East now. That part of the world I never saw, but I, I've been all essentially around the world except for that part of it. Courtesy of the, of the government, I guess you'd say. Yeah. That's about it. Sorry I couldn't do a better job of no, this remembering is, it. This, this I, is again, great. I have to, I'm grateful to, the, to the, uh, the government for keeping all these records. I was amazed uh, that they would have all of this. But boy, they, they had all the details. They can tell you exactly when you were where and what, and what ships you were on, when you signed off, and when you were off of it, on to the next one whole bit. So it's been a big help and you can have this copy if you wish to hear. We'll terminate it then, okay?